Hi everyone, welcome to our fifth confirmation class. So far, we've done a lot as far as the baptismal promises are concerned. Do you reject Satan? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth? We've gone through all of these topics. And this next one is one that's really exciting to me, something that I like a lot. It's, do you believe in the church? Do you believe in the Catholic church? Oh, man, this is one of those loaded sort of things where like uh, a lot of people have a lot of opinions about the Catholic Church. A lot of people have a lot of opinions about the Catholic Church. Like what is the church? And a lot of people will think it's like an, a bunch of old cardinals and bishops living in Rome. All these old men who like to make a bunch of rules so that all of us can be very, very miserable. But there's that couldn't be farther from the truth. The church is a community. The church is you and me. The church uh, for 2,000 years has stood up for some of the most important topics of our life. Now, before we get into that, we're going to pray in a different way. I was praying about what prayer to do this time, and we're going to do a litany again, but this will be a different type of litany. This is called the Litany of Humility. You can go ahead and look up the Litany of Humility right now on Google, just like Google search on your phone or on the computer, Litany of Humility Catholic, and it's going to come up and it's going to be this litany. So, the litany is a call and response type of prayer if you do it with multiple people. If you do it by yourself, you just read both parts. Pretty easy, easy to understand, uh, not that hard of a prayer. But the litany of, uh, of humility is kind of hard in its content. Uh, here's what I mean. Have you ever seen, like, I, I've seen this interaction before, not with our priests, but with other ones. Like, you see some person go up to father after mass as he's greeting people after mass and uh they say something like oh father that homily today was wonderful i loved it it's exactly what i needed to hear and then the priest says something like oh that wasn't for me that was from the lord i give all credit to him and it's like very showy and awkward. Some people would say that, you know, he's trying to express humility, but I don't think that's what that is. Like if, if someone's being really, really showy when you compliment them, being like, hey, nice shirt. And they're like, oh, this thing. Oh, well, you know, I, I got it at Goodwill. It's not that big of a deal. Your shirt's way better. That's not humility. That's like a weird false humility. Can't really place exactly what that is, but definitely not humility. What is humility in general? It's not thinking about yourself very much, which is good and important. You know, last week I talked about love. Love is wanting something good for someone else, doing it and wanting nothing in return, to will the good of the other and to do something about it. And if we're going to be loving people, sometimes we have to think a little bit less about our insecurities and a little bit less about ourselves and more about other people. That doesn't mean we shouldn't think about ourselves at all. Like, if you smell bad, take a shower. It's okay to be self-aware. It's not okay to be obsessive uh, in a prideful way about your appearance and obsessive in a prideful way about what other people think about you. Think about this. If you didn't think about yourself more, would you be happier or sadder? If you weren't as insecure, would you be happier or sadder? If you didn't care about what the society cares about uh, in, this, in this world, what you're wearing, how you're dressed, would you be happier or sadder? If you cared less about what other people thought about you, would you be happier or sadder? Probably a little more happy and a little bit better at loving people. That's what the litany of humility is for. So if any of these make you feel weird, any of these prompts that I'm about to read in this lit litany, this back and forth litany, if it makes you feel weird, it's, it's not how it's supposed to make you feel. Remember that Catholics aren't about Catholic guilt. That's something society puts on the church. Guilt is supposed to inform your conscience so that you can learn. And when you're done learning, you throw the guilt away. Okay, here we go. The litany of humility. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. 
The response is, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being esteemed. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being calumniated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected, deliver me, Jesus. Okay, the next prompt, prompt is, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. So go ahead and say that with me. That others may be loved more than I. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be esteemed more than I. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be chosen and I set aside. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be praised and I unnoticed. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be preferred to me in everything. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Whew, that's a hard one to pray. It's hard to put others first, but this kind of gets down into the reality of the, the fact that we're called to love, not to be vain and think of ourselves and be prideful and think of ourselves. No, no, pride is one of the cardinal sins. It's one of the biggest sins. It's at the root of a lot of our other sins. This beats up that pride. It's like it beats up the problem underneath all of the symptoms. Anyway, I hope you liked it. Try praying it for a week uh, and see what it does in your life. It's not supposed to beat you up. That's not what the litany of humility is about. It's just supposed to ground you in the reality that we're supposed to live our lives for others. All right, let's get into our Bible study for today. We're going to read through a little bit of scripture, starting with Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Remember, remember the Bible hack I gave you. Take your Bible, split it in half. Take the second half of the Bible, split that in half. And no matter where you do that, you're going to end somewhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, which are the four Gospels. So if you're looking for the four Gospels, the four most important books of the Bible, I would claim, uh, then that's how you get there. So again, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 20. I always say it's not a race to get there, but some people typically win. Here we go. All right. So the Catholic Church, is it the church? I mean, after all, you see so many different churches out there. There are over 40,000 different denominations of Christianity out there. That's 40,000 different churches with different rules. So what makes the Catholic Church the church? Well, plenty of things. But I think what I'm going to point to today is that one, Jesus made the church. That's really important. And that two, the other denominations of Christianity were made by other people. I mean, Lutheranism, where did the Lutheran church come from? It was founded by Martin Luther. Where did the Calvinist church come from? John Calvin. 
I could go through all the other denominations of Christianity, not all 40,000, that would be really hard, and I could point to a different person who founded the church. The Catholic Church is one of those churches that says, oh no, we were founded by Jesus Christ, historically. Some other people will say, oh no, we follow Jesus. That's good that you follow Jesus, but do you follow Jesus in just some of the text, or do you follow him when he said in the Bible that he is creating a church. Some people will say, I'm, religi I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual. I follow Jesus, I don't follow a church. It's a bunch of nonsense. Because here in this bit of uh, the Gospel of Matthew, what we're gonna see is Jesus made a church. So if you follow Jesus, that means, are you gonna follow him on some stuff and not other stuff? Or are you gonna follow him entirely? Following him entirely means following his church that he created, that's here in scripture. This is called uh, Peter's Confession About Jesus. I'm gonna read through it once and then point through other parts of it. This is where Jesus establishes the church. Peter's Confession to Jesus, verse 13. When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdoms of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He then strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. Okay, there's so much cool stuff going on here. Um, it's really jam-packed, so we're going to take it apart, even though it's just a few little verses. Something's interesting about Peter. In the Bible, in the New Testament, the name that is most often referred to, that is said most often, is the name of Jesus, which makes sense if it's all about Jesus. But the second name that you hear the most of 155 times is Peter. And in this scripture, Jesus is saying, Peter, you are the rock in which I will build my church. Now, he's directly saying right there, I'm, I'm building a church. Only one other time is the word church used in scripture. And it's saying that the church needs to mediate um, people who have different problems, right? Different issues. But here he's saying, I'm establishing a church on you, Peter. In other words, Peter, you will be the first pope. That's what Catholics claim, is that St. Peter was the very first pope. In the line of succession from St. Peter to Pope Francis, there have been 267 popes. We have a line connecting each and every one of them. We know their names, we know when they lived, we know when they died, we know what they did. It's the longest running institution ever in existence, more than the Ming Dynasty, more than anything that's ever happened. The papacy has lasted for 2,000 years. What makes Peter so special? Sure, his name was mentioned 155 times. As a quick side note, the next most mentioned names was just in the 40s with James. It's important to know that the name of James also is... Um, attributed to four different people. One Peter, 155 times. Four different Jameses, only 44 times. So, Peter's important. And there's other parts in scripture that, that really set him aside as the leader after Jesus leaves. For example, in Luke chapter 22, Peter is told to strengthen his brethren after he has returned from his denial. So Jesus predicts that, G that Peter is going to deny him three times. And then he says, after this event, you, Peter, are going to have to strengthen your brethren. He calls Peter out as the leader. 
In John chapter 20, Jesus sends Mary Magdalene to tell Peter and the others about the resurrection. Who does, it, who does Jesus appear to first after he rises from the dead? Well, a woman who, said, who is told, go tell Peter and the others. There's something primal about Peter being very important. In John chapter 21, Jesus tells Peter personally to feed his lambs. No one else is given that command in scripture. If you look at the book of Acts, the book of Acts has Peter at the front of it, working miracles, talking about the church, proclaiming Jesus Christ. He's like the main character of the book of Acts. A quick fun fact. Did you know that Luke, the gospel, and Acts are actually just one book. So if you read Luke and then jump straight to Acts, you have like a continuation of the same gospel writer. So if you want to read the gospel of Luke and then say like what happened right after Jesus left the scene, go straight into Acts. You won't regret it. It's some of the best, most exciting parts uh, of, of the Bible. Peter's really important. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you the keys to heaven. Here are my keys. These are them. If I gave you my keys, if I gave you these keys, what would that mean? If I said, hey, these keys are now yours. It would mean that you would become the owner of a Jeep Compass from 2015. It's rusty. It has over 160,000 miles on it. It's a church car for sure. Uh, you know, the radio doesn't work. It's not the best car, but it would be yours if I gave you the keys to it. You would have the keys to my house, you, which means you can walk in anytime you want to. That's yours now. You would have the keys to my office. You could just sit down on my computer and work if you wanted to. Keys are a symbol of authority. And so when Jesus says that you have the keys to heaven, that, that gives him a particular authority on earth that Peter passes down through to every leader of the faith. From Pope to Pope to Pope, he's establishing authority over the church on earth. This is where it is scripturally. Peter, um, you know, has a heck of a job. And if you think about it, like he's a flawed person. He messes up all through scripture. Like, at, like right after Peter's confession, um, that we just read, the next thing Jesus says to him is, get behind me, Satan. Of course he's not perfect. Of course popes aren't perfect. Of course the people of the church aren't perfect. But what the church has is the truth. Even though we're flawed, we have the truth with us. Um, and I think that's important to notice too. Like, think of it this way. Um, out of the 12 bishops the 12 apostles, who were the first people to follow Jesus, one of them, Judas, betrayed him. I mean, one of the first leaders of the church did an absolutely terrible job um, doing the right thing. He did the wrong thing. Who's to say that that's true today? I mean, it's probably true today that there are bishops out there, there are priests out there who do bad and wrong things. We're a human institution, which means we're going to mess up. And, and you've probably seen our mistakes in the news, in the media, and you'll see more mistakes that the Catholic Church has made. But it doesn't take away from the fact that Jesus started it. He makes, he qu calls sinners to, to lead his church. It's a crazy idea, but he establishes it meaning there is goodness in this family, in this community, in this world called the church. The next thing that's really important in this scripture is, where are they during this time? Like Jesus is establishing his, his church and, and giving it to Peter as being the guy who's in charge, right? With his help, no doubt. But where is he establishing his church? He's establishing it, did you catch the name of the town in Caesarea Philippi? Caesarea Philippi in that time was the region where people would worship pagan fertility gods. Now, uh, if you put, use your mind to think about this, fertility gods, that means they were doing types of worship based around like the birds and the bees. So this was like the red light district, you could say, of the area at the time. It was the center of cultural depravity. 
They had no morality like we do today. They had no morality of Jesus Christ. And he takes his disciples there to start his church. That's important. That's important because he, he takes people into the, the reality. He doesn't say, okay, let's start a church with a $10 million facility. No. He doesn't say, let's start a church in a comfy suburb. No, he starts his church in the center of the world where bad things happen. And not only that, he takes his disciples there who are uh, it, like in the ages of like the teenage years. We say that Peter was about 18 years old at this time. He chooses young people to lead his church because young people are not the future of the church. They are the church right now. If you're getting confirmed, you are the church right now. That's important. That's important to note. Another thing that I just love about this bit of scripture is um, when, uh, yeah, when, when Jesus says the gates of the netherworld, um, let's see, let's actually look it up. I, I don't want to misquote it. Yes, okay, so verse 18. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. A lot of people say that the gates of the netherworld, uh, like hell, is coming after us. And Jesus in this moment is saying, no, the gates of the netherworld will not overcome the church. He's not saying that. What does a gate do? A gate keeps things out. And so when Jesus says, the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it, this is what he's saying. He's saying that Christianity, he's saying that religion, the church that he's founding, will destroy evil, will knock down the gates of hell, and bust in there and make a difference in this world. This is a part of the community that you're called to do. You as a Christian, as a Catholic, as someone who wants to get confirmed, is being called to just get rid of the evil of the world with Jesus' help. To just love people rather than to use people. To love people rather than to abuse people. To love people rather than to ridicule people. To love people rather than to separate people and to accuse people and to, to destroy people. The love of the church, which is a part of the community that you're called to, has the power to change the world. And it has. There's 1.2 billion Catholics on this world in this world. Just imagine if we all had that mentality of saying, let's stomp out evil together the best that we can, even though we're sinners, even though we're going to mess up, let's say sorry and get back to it, to stomping out the evil of this world. Now, uh, like Jesus took it upon himself to hang out with 12 people, 12 original disciples. And they were all different. They all had different gifts. They all had different backgrounds. Some were fishermen, some were tax collectors. And the same is true today. He calls different people in a different community to add to the church. The reality is that you and I, as Catholics, need to know that the church is a community. The church isn't a building. The church doesn't belong to Father so-and-so and Father whoever and Deacon whoever. It doesn't belong to them. It belongs to all of us. The church is a community. And what does that community stand for? Like when we say that we're a community, what do we stand for? Well, the Catholic Church for 2,000 years has been the head, has been the, the, the foremost teacher of human dignity for everyone. Everyone from conception to a natural death. That means that the Catholic Church and our pro-life movement isn't just pro-birth. That's pro-mental like mental health. When at any age, that's pro like making sure that you have the ability to eat and to get, go to school and to get educated. That's pro-life to the point of, of death that you have dignity in your older years. The Catholic Church has stood for that for 2,000 years, being the creators of hospital networks, being the creators of college. The Catholic Church invented college. We believe in human dignity for everyone. We believe in the importance of the family. 
We've been upholding that for years when it was countercultural. Guys, you know this to be true. When your parents are arguing, when you're really upset at home and the family is just like out of sorts, it's horrible. It's horrible when the family suffers. It's horrible to live in your house when you're, you know, when things aren't going well. The Catholic Church is the one church that has been saying for 2,000 years, if you want to be a part of this community, we want to help the family. We want the family to thrive. We've been at the forefront of that. You shouldn't feel miserable every single time you go home. They support the family. They support the importance of dignity and work. If you read the compendium of the Catholic Church, we were at the forefront, especially during the Industrial Revolution, of saying that workers have rights, that we shouldn't work a million hours a week, that there's something to, the, the, to leisure time, to good, holy leisure time. Um, I would recommend looking up the, compend the compendium of the Catholic Church. I'll even buy you one if you ask me, um, if you want to read more about like that. We have a care from creation. Just look at Pope Francis and, and Laudato Si saying we have a common home. Um, but most importantly, I think this is great, that the Catholic Church has been championing um, forgiveness and second chances for, and, and mercy for, for as long as it's been in existence. We're the church that says, it's okay, just say sorry. Just say sorry, and here's the mercy that you need. We don't hold back mercy from anyone. No matter where you go in this life, no matter what happens to you in your life, no matter what sins you've made, no matter how far you drift from the Catholic Church, Jesus says this to you, that you're welcome here. Just turn around, say sorry, and then you're welcome Immediately, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who or what type of person you're attracted to. It doesn't matter uh, what you believe in. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your sins have been. Jesus loves you. That's who he loves. That's what he's about. He loves sinners. That's the community that we're to love one another. Do you want to be a part of that Catholic Church community? And yes, I know, like, if you go to a non-denominational church, like I went to one that's called Northway. I walked into Northway and gosh, it looked like professional interior designers designed the whole place. It was gorgeous. It was like HGTV, like so cool. And yeah, maybe the Catholic church kind of smells kind of musty or maybe like, you know, the places where you hang out in the church don't look professionally designed or maybe the music isn't as great. You're going to find that that's true that other churches, that other denominations, sure, they do other things better, but they don't do the truth better. That when you ask Siri who created um, the Lutheran church, it would be Martin Luther, but if you asked Siri or asked ChatGPT, like, who created the Catholic church, they're going to say Jesus Christ. Look, there's plenty of things that you can be frustrated with the Catholic church about. You know, maybe you heard in the news that they mismanaged money. That's frustrating. Maybe the sex abuse stuff, that's horrific and terrible. There's no excuse for the sins of the church. Of course, there's no excuse for it. And I won't make any excuses for the bad things that have happened in the Catholic Church, the Crusades and things like that. No, no. But you're also going to hear things about the Catholic Church that are just kind of wrong and dumb. Like people will say, oh, tax the churches. Did you know the church has been the most um, charitable organization for years and years and years in the world? On planet Earth, the Catholic Church has given more to charity than any other institution. I mean, people will say, oh, tax the churches. Well, I would say, well, tax nonprofits because we're so charitable. Why would you do that? And, and I work for the church. Ask my, ask the priest here if he pays payroll tax. Of course he does. It's not like we don't pay any taxes at all. Or some people will make this criticism. You know, if the Catholic Church just sold all their cathedrals and sold all of their priceless art, that they could give that money to the poor. Have you heard that one? I've heard that one. My question is this. Why is, like, the onus put on us to, to sell those things. What about the people who have the money to buy the priceless art? 
Aren't they responsible for the poor too? And the priceless art, imagine if you were an artist in like the 1600s and you dedicate your whole life to painting this beautiful fresco so that people could pray with it forever and ever and ever. And then someone's like, no, you must sell that. That's not fair to the artists who dedicated their lives to God. And that's the reality. The treasures of the church don't belong to a few priests. They belong to the community of the Catholic Church. The buildings of the Catholic Church belong to you. The art of the Catholic Church belongs to you. The relics of the Catholic Church belong to you. Belong to the community of 1.2 billion people. Doesn't belong to me as a worker. Doesn't belong to Father as a priest. It belongs to you. So you're going to hear plenty of criticisms about the Catholic Church. You're going to. Some of them might be pretty good. A lot of them are really, really bad and wrong. But you can know this, that this community, this community of love was made for you. That this community of love was founded by Jesus Christ. And that's something we can take pride in as Catholics. So let's end this session with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, help us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for every good thing that's happened to us this day. Lord Jesus, we ask that we can become more involved in your community, the church, so that we can love other people better so that we can avoid pride and be humble of heart, so that we can be a part of the church and change the parts of the church that we can and love the parts of the church that are in stone. Finally, Lord, um, help us to be holy both at church and away from church, in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, and anywhere we go. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Guys, I hope you really enjoyed this session today. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, and we'll see you next time.